So welcome to Raising the Bar, unique strategies from nonprofit leaders on how to supercharge event revenue. Uh, today's agenda, we're gonna start with some welcome and introductions. Then we're gonna hear from all of our guests. Uh, then we're going to learn about defining your event, go through some auction and gala revenue enhancers, some golf fundraising revenue enhancers, uh, community fund run and walkathon revenue enhancers to raise the fundraising bar. And we're gonna go through how you can increase donor acquisition, retention, engagement, and revenue with a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser leading up to your event. And then we will get to questions and answers. But if you do have any questions, make sure you submit them throughout the session so we can get them in there and get those answered for you. Uh, so I'm gonna start with some introductions. Our panel is made up, we have fantastic guests today. We have Tori, she is the Executive Director of Jackson Hole Therapeutic Riding. Thanks for being here with us today, Tori. Pleasure. We have David Blyer, who is the co-founder, president, and CEO of Ariva. Hi, David. Thanks for being here. No, it's a wonderful thing to do, and I appreciate all the panelists of Tori and Jay and and uh, Gabby, and I'm excited to listen to the audience as well. Yes, and then we have Jay Fisk, who is our chief auctioneer and co-president co-president of Ariva's Microsoft Auction Division. Hi, Jay. How are you doing? Doing great. I'm looking forward to another great webinar. And thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. And my name is Gabriella Salemi. I'm the digital marketing manager here at Oriva, and I'll be moderating, moderating your session today. So I want to go ahead and get started. You're going to see a poll pop up on your screen right now. Uh, we want to know how many fundraising events do you run in a year? Um, and by fundraising events, this can be any kind of event. Maybe it's a donor appreciation gala, maybe an event for volunteers, um, maybe it's an auction gala or golf fundraiser, um, maybe it's a walkathon or a fun run. But we want to just kind of gauge how many events the entire audience is doing um, in an, on an annual basis. We have some, a lot of people pouring in, so I'll give it a minute. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and present these results so you all can see. So it seems like it's kind of split, uh, but we do have some people that are doing five or more. We have some people that are doing one, um, but it seems to be pretty even throughout the entire group. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next poll. You're going to see another poll pop on your screen um, and go ahead and answer that. We wanna know what is the average numbers of attendees, the average number of attendees at your event usually? Um, Maybe you're under 100, you're in that, you know, middle range of 500 to 700, over 900 and upwards. We just want to gauge how big your events are on an average basis. So if you're running multiple events a year, what would you say like the average number of attendees is for all those events? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share those results. So it seems like the majority of you are hosting events where you have 100 to 300 guests or under 100 guests. That's great to see. That's a good amount. Mm -hmm. Next question. We want to know what are the biggest challenges around fundraising events? This poll is a little different. You can select multiple of them. You don't need to select just one. Um, so is it getting people to attend? Um, are you having trouble finding auction items? Maybe it's check-in, check-out. Do you have long lines that you're check-in and check-out? Is it taking a lot of time to get people in and out the door? Um, is it lighting, sound, staging, anything to do with technical aspects, design? Uh, not enough volunteers. Do you have trouble finding volunteers uh, to help with your events? Or maybe you're not raising enough through your events. And if you're not raising enough, you're at the right webinar because we are going to talk about a lot of revenue enhancers for every event that you have. Okay, I'll let a few more people get answers in. We have a big group today. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share these results. So it seems like it's the majority of you are having trouble getting people to attend and you're not raising enough through your events um, and also with finding auction items. Um, so this is great feedback for us, but it's also great to see no one's having issues with lighting, sound and staging. So silver lining there. Okay. Our next poll for you, we want to know, um, you have to move your event data into your donor relationship management database, and is this time consuming? So once your event is done, where do you store that data? Is it in an integrated system? Are you having to move it to separate systems? 
um, does your system allow you to acknowledge all the attendees from your event? And is this time consuming if you're having to move that data around? Um, or maybe you're not sure about where your data lives and we can help you with that as well. Okay, go ahead and share the results. So it seems like the majority of you are having, spending a lot of time moving your event data into a donor relationship management database. And we have a great solutions for that on this webinar as well today. And then we have one final question and then I'm gonna pass it over to our great panel here. Um, but we wanna know, and this is a question where you can select multiple, have you ever um, used a team fundraiser or a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser to help promote your event or maybe raise more before an event? or in conjunction with an event. Um, I see a few answers coming in here. Um, and we're gonna go through, and some of you, you may not know the difference between a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser or a team fundraiser. And if you don't, that's okay. We're gonna cover that in today's session as well and talk about how each of them can enhance your revenue, um, but in different ways and which is the right one to use. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share this. So it seems like the majority of you have never used a team fundraiser or peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. And some of you have used both and some of you have used peer-to-peer -peer, and a few of you have used team fundraising. So that's really interesting to see as well. Okay, and with that, I'm going to pass this over to our panel. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. All right. I guess I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, thanks so much for helping us with the with the poll. We appreciate that. Uh, we uh, we may be able to help some of you on an individual basis. If one of those uh, poll questions is a burning issue for us, before you please reach out to us. And uh, we we love post event uh, co consulting with people on a case by case basis. But let's get into the webinar. So monetary goals and non-monetary goals. So one of the things we always like to, uh, to, to start with is deciding why are we having an event? And not every event necessarily has the same reason. Sometimes we put together events because we are you know, needing to raise a lot of money. Sometimes we put together events as a thank you uh, to our existing donors or to to acknowledge donors, uh, maybe to increase awareness of our cause and that sort of thing. So, uh, so we always like to start with making sure we have a good grasp of why are we doing this? You know, <laughs> if, is, there a re is there a reason behind why we're having an event? And I know that Tori can talk a little bit to why they have an event with, uh, with, with, what, uh, with what you do, Tori. Yeah, so um, our event is an evening um, polo match and live auction, um, seated dinner, and various activities throughout the event to engage our donors in um, our mission and what our mission stands for, who we serve. And one element of our event is showcasing our riders. Um, we're a therapeutic riding center, and so our participants are able to show off their skills at the event and it really forms this connection with those that are attending the event who may be you know purchasing tickets simply because they want to go to a party but throughout that evening they're actually engaging in the mission and forming a connection to what it is that we do yeah so ongoing ongoing promotion of your mission yes uh, is, a, is a great reason to to have an event it, it that should not be the only reason and as Tori pointed out, uh, yes, that's very important. We want people to know what what we're doing, but we also raise a fair amount of money, and you'll see that as we start going through the slides. So one of the things that I that I always like to ask a client right from the get go is, what's your budget? What's your annual budget, and where does that money come from? And you'll you know we'll hear about. Uh, annual donations, we'll hear about sponsorships, and we'll hear about, uh, you know, a wide, wide variety of ways the money comes in. And one of those elements, one of the slices of the pie of the income is event is an event. But uh, it's important to understand that that event is just one slice of your income pie, if you will, you've got a lot of different ways to, to bring money in, hopefully you're not uh, relying on an annual event to be 100% of your budget. That's probably not a good thing. 
So your your event is, is going to augment your budget in some way. And this is going to relate in a, in a minute to what type of an event would be appropriate. And so we'll get into that in just a bit. But there's different kinds of events. Obviously, there's appreciation galas. And Tori talked a little bit about, about that. Uh, there's donor exclusive gatherings where you just, you know, it's a, like VIP only type, type gatherings and places to, you know, support our volunteers and recognize them, maybe having a, an award uh, program of some kind to give out awards to volunteers, uh, monthly giving events. And as you can see in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, fundraising events and fundraising events primarily is what we're going to be talking about during, uh, during this webinar. And Jay, just to touch on it, I think it's really important uh, when you're really thinking about any event that you're doing and, and why we say you determine the type of event we talk a lot about one thing and i and, and i think we talk about this every single day is the audience right every audience is a little bit different regardless whether it's a fundraising event or you're acknowledging you know volunteer recognition for your wonderful volunteers or or donors or i mean there's a lot and these are just a couple of examples of the different types of events but really when you determine what type of event it is and you really understand the audience this is also goes back to what you said too, is what type of budget are you having? You know, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, is it fundraising at the same time? Is it, you know, non-monetary? I, I mean, so there's a lot of things on that and I never want to lose sight of audiences, right? Because you, you, you need to make sure with one group, you're addressing one thing and with another group, you're addressing something else. And I, and I don't take those things lightly. So that was a really good point, Jay. Thank you. Or you want to kick in anything before we go to the next slide? Nope, I'm I'm good there. All right, so uh, so let's talk about what kind of event will it be. And I, I mentioned before the budget, talking talking about the budget. Uh, the event really needs to be appropriate for what you need in the budget. In other words, if you throw a party and hope it makes money, then you really are kind of behind your behind your curve a little bit. It really should be how much money do we need, and then what is a type of event that can reasonably expect it to bring in that amount. In other words, start with how much you need and work backwards into the budget. I'm sorry, work backwards into the event as opposed to starting with the event and then seeing, well, you know, how much money can we make? Because the, if, if you need $20,000, you don't need to put on a $100,000 event. If on the other hand, you need $100,000, a uh, $20,000 event's not gonna get you there. So the budget is really the anchor, if you will. How much money do we need? Now, what kind of event will get us to that point? And maybe it's not a single event a year. It might be multiple events. We might need to do two, three, or four different events. And we noticed in the poll, some of you do multiple events per year. And that's probably because you're finding that they're, they're just serving different purposes. There are some events that serve one financial need. There's some events that serve other financial needs. And there's some events that maybe aren't necessarily financial uh, type events, but they're serving another purpose like a like a recognition or that sort of thing but if you start with it with the budget you can you can then appropriately size the event that can achieve that can achieve that that budget so fundraising and auction galas a lot of people are doing that probably most people on this call are doing that community fun runs walkathons uh, a lot more people participate in that typically than an auction an auction might have I think our average on the poll was two to three hundred people. Uh, you know, there were outliers, of course, on both ends. There was one I saw. There was one. One of you have a have an event with with over nine hundred people, and you know that, that's certainly an outlier. Uh, but typically, the sweet spot for auctions is going to be a two hundred to four hundred person audience. When you talk about fun runs and walkathons, you probably aren't going to make enough money if you only if you only have a hundred people participating in that. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Uh, same thing with a golf tournament. Golf tournaments, by definition, are are limited to 144 golfers with a full field. Uh, now, you might run two different fields, two different golf tournaments, something like that. Maybe you have a North 18 and a South 18. But typically, on a single golf course, the maximum number of golfers you can have is 144 people. So you, you start looking at, well, how much money can we reasonably expect to get out of 144 people versus how much money can we expect to get out of a, an auction with maybe 400 people? Versus a walkathon where we might need 500 or more people to participate in that. So just just wrap your your head around that. Are we picking the right kind of fundraiser to get us to where we're trying to get with the goal that we've set and the goal that we need? Yeah. 
will revenue enhancing elements. Uh, am I gonna am I gonna tackle that one too? Right off the bat, I'm happy to do that. Jay, these are right up your alley, which yeah, is anyway. which is a beautiful thing. So when when you think of well, let's talk about an auction gala as an example. So that's the first one on the lower left. Think of an auction gala. It, obvious ways you make money from an auction gala are what? Selling items and asking for donations, right? You've got your silent auction, you've got your live auction, you've got your raise the paddle. Uh, but then there's other things you can do as part of that auction. Like, and we're going to get into this in just momentarily. We have what we call pre-event money, during event money, and post-event money. And we're going to discuss all of those. Pre-event money, things might be like what you charge to get into the gala. Pre-event money might be advertising that you sell to go into your program book. Pre-event money might be sponsorships. That's pre-event money. During the event, of course, it's the live auction, silent auction, raise the paddle. And then we're going to talk about some what I call revenue enhancers that we can throw in. So instead of raising money from three or four things during your auction, you're raising money for maybe five or six or seven things during your auction. And there's also an element of that we call uh, active revenue enhancers and passive revenue enhancers. Active revenue enhancers being things that you do something to get money. And then there's passive revenue enhancers where you make money because you put the right system in place. And the system, if you will, passively makes you money. And we'll talk about the passive revenue enhancers as well. The golf fundraising uh, revenue enhancers, we'll talk about that. Again, typically, how do you make money on a golf tournament? Well, you sell foursomes. And then you sell individual entries. And then people play golf. And maybe at the end of the round, you might have a silent auction and maybe a live auction during your gala. But what about doing a silent auction during the round as opposed to after the round? Uh, something we call an 18-hole uh, auction, where the golfers literally during the time that they're playing the golf, while they're riding in their cart, they could be participating in a silent auction. And that could be done through mobile through mobile bidding. And then community fund runs, walkathons, and revenue enhancers. David, why don't you tackle that one? Yeah, I, I think we'll touch on that a little bit. But, you know, one of the things that I found interesting on these community walks and fundraisers, as, as far as an enhancer goes, is a lot of people, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is they talk about team fundraisers. And, and you know, it's interesting because we had one, one of our clients say, oh, we're doing three team fundraisers. And we were sharing that with somebody else. And they said, oh, my God, team fundraising, it's enough to do one. But what was really interesting in the in the pivoting of this was it's about an event and they're doing three different events and they staggered these three events where a lot of people were here were saying, you know, we do three or four events. Uh, when you're doing events, you can name them events and you can add on team fundraising, which is a major enhancer of not only raising more money, but you're, you know, really it's a scalable way of really emphasizing a lot more people because once a captain starts talking about that and he's building his own teams and then underneath them they're building their own teams or getting more donations they're also creating awareness about that specific event and it's a wonderful wonderful thing so don't ne necessarily always look at team fundraising as that major effort of doing that event look at it from the event side and how I could enhance that event even further, because a lot of people also do team fundraising. They do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. But these community funds are in walks. You can tie a lot of that with even, even bringing them in on helping to enhance from a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. If you can't join, you know, um, maybe you could do an, your own individual page. So there's a lot of good things when you're doing community runs and walkathons on those type of enhancements of really building out, you know, future donor acquisitions and and really the donor donor retentions and really raising more money at the same time. So there's a really a lot of good things on doing those differently. So let's get into start sharing some rev, some some of these enhancers. Now we kind of teed it up here a little bit, if you will. Sorry for the golf metaphor there, yeah. but uh, since we kind of have it set up here, let's 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 get into let's get into some of these enhancers. Let me let let's share some of these. Now some of these may be obvious to you. You know, we've got a hundred and some people on this. Uh, webinar and some of this they may already be doing and some they may not be doing so let's kick it over to uh, Tori and talk specifically about how, how you make money with Jackson Hole Therapeutic Writing. Yeah so our annual fundraiser is called Stomping the Divots um, and like I mentioned earlier it is an evening event 
Um, it includes a polo match and various activities that our attendees can engage in throughout the event. Um, several of which are geared towards making money, of course, because it is um, our largest annual fundraiser. And so some of the ways that we, we've been doing the event now for 22 years, um, and our goal this year is $475,000. So that's a lot of money to raise in a single evening. And so in order to accomplish that, we have um, over the last 22 years added several different elements um, that we have found work to raise the money that we need and also ditch other elements that we have decided really cause us to put in so much effort without um, the return on investment, if you will. And so some of the ways, Gabby, if you wanna switch to the next slide, um, some of the ways that we have found work for us is a raffle, um, a live auction, and what we call cost of caring. And so that's your, your basic paddle raise. Um, and we also do a horse sponsorship. And so each of these elements is kind of spread throughout the evening, if you will. So we're not asking for money back to back to back. We're giving our attendees time to enjoy the event, enjoy the evening, um, spend time getting to know each other. And then we're able to ask for money without it feeling like they just have to have their pocketbooks out the entire time. Um, we did in the past do a silent auction that for us, we found has not been as successful as the raffle baskets have. We've been able to raise just as much money with the raffle as we were with the silent auction, but with a fraction of the time spent on the front end and the back end. So um, those are some of the elements. The horse sponsorship I'll kind of talk about a little bit more just because our program is so unique in that you know, we have these large, very expensive animals to um, support throughout the year. And so rather than have it be a traditional auction where people are bidding against one another, we have it as a flat fee of $4,000 per horse. And so each person who wants to sponsor a horse simply raises their paddle and we're able to raise over $50,000 within five minutes um, just by having it a flat fee. We have considered doing um, a, like a bidding war, if you will, but um, that again, stretches out the, the ask for money. And instead, this way we're able to ensure that we cover the cost of our horses um, and we don't stretch the evening longer than it needs to be. Now, Tori, is it a, is it a one-to-one -one relationship in the sense that one person pays 4,000 or can, you, can people go in together? Can you put two people in at 2,000 each or four people in? to uh, at a thousand each to get there or, or how, how do you work that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we can do that. Um, thankfully, Maestro is very great with the back end of the system, allowing us to kind of navigate how to spread out the bills to each of our attendees. But what we have them do is raise their paddle and then we coordinate that at the checkout. And it's super seamless on our end um, and very easy for the attendees to uh, to navigate that process so you use you use this use the split the split pay yes yeah okay all right good well i, I wasn't sure whether you know if someone had three thousand dollars to give you and we can't they can't do it because they can't buy a full horse right so this way it does allow you to to combine some people together to to cover the, the horse correct correct and that that's a great point too um the reason why we have so many different elements to engage our donors in in giving to our program program is because we realized that simply because they're able to afford the $400 ticket to our event doesn't mean that everybody's giving capacity is the same. And so by allowing those who may only have $100 to spend at the event to still give that $100 and not turn away, you know, 10 people who want to give $100 um, and really only focus on the big ticket items, we're engaging everybody in giving throughout the event. I kind of describe that uh, as a, I call it a buying power pyramid. Mm -hmm. got, visualize a pyramid. There are folks at the top that could pretty much underwrite the entire event, right? And it'd be a, they, they pay all $400,000. Uh, but there's maybe only be one or two of those that are <laughs> there, maybe have the interest. And at the bottom of the pyramid are people that are, maybe they they only have $100 to spend or whatever. But you want, up and down that pyramid, you want to give everybody an opportunity to participate at their own capability 
and to go away feeling good about that they were able to to help regardless of their of their individual financial capability. So it's it's good that good that you put in multiple elements. And that may be a lesson for everybody listening here. Most of you probably are already aware of that, but it's good in an event to have something for everybody. You want everyone at some level to feel uh, that they are able to contribute. I call it uh, having a room full of bidders versus a room full of eaters. Because if you have people who are just there for the dinner, well, they're going to eat the food. But if you have people there to support you, even at a hundred dollar level, uh, then you have people that are going to give you money as well as eat the food. So I want a room full of bidders, not a room full of eaters. David, were you going to add something to that? You look, you no, I, like yeah, person. Tori, you mentioned the raffle. We had a couple of questions. I was just curious. Is the raffle live or is it virtual as well? Do you do both? That's, that's a good question. We actually sell tickets prior to the event on our webpage. Um, and so whether people are attending or not, they can still participate in the raffle, which we have found brings in a considerable amount of income prior to the event. Um, and also allows people who you know may live elsewhere or who are not able to attend that year to still participate and engage in our activities. Um, and then we continue to sell the raffle tickets at the event with a hard cutoff time um, and then the winners are announced at the event but if individuals are not present they are still able to win Thank you. Had, yeah I was, go ahead jay please no no i three questions that just popped up i don't know what you were going to ask about that david i was going to cover the three questions that just popped up yeah why don't you do that so there were three questions just came up one was what are your suggestions on how to fundraise by asking for a minimum donation and then get an organization logoed item uh you know the the, the logoed item should be a re should be a revenue generator so you it doesn't help you to bring in $25 and give away a $30 shirt right so uh you want to make sure that whatever you're giving and so it's, I love the idea of giving a gift in exchange for a donation I think it's wonderful if you could do that and the logo uh whether it's a, on a logo on a glass or logo on a shirt or whatever that has longevity it means that uh that people will be looking at that well beyond th the date of your event and that that's a reminder that they were there to help you, which is good. The second one is raffle. What's a raffle basket? I think that might have meant what is a bucket raffle. I could be wrong on that, but uh, we use the term bucket raffle. Uh, and the bucket raffle essentially uh, you bypasses a silent auction. You lay out all of your items. You put a little bucket or basket or hat or a box or something uh, in front of each item, and people buy raffle tickets, and they drop the raffle tickets into the bucket uh, related to the item that they'd like to to win. And what's nice about that is they can stuff one one basket or one bucket. They they might want to put 10 raffle tickets in one because they really want to win that item and maybe put one ticket or two tickets in the other item. So it's a it, it's a nice way to to do a raffle uh, where you don't uh where you don't determine what people win. They determine the buyers determine what they're going to win by virtue of fact where they put their tickets. That, by the way, can be automated using mobile bidding. Using uh, we happen to have a, a system called Text to Bid, and that can that whole bucket raffle concept can be done on mobile bidding using using Text to Bid. The other question was platforms free or paid that allow an organization to run a virtual raffle, and that would be Text to Bid. Text to Bid mobile bidding uh, does allow you to uh, do a to do a virtual raffle, so people can be anywhere, you know, subject to the laws of the state and the city, that sort of thing. There may be some issues there. But uh, you can certainly uh, automate that with a uh, with a mobile platform. All right. So there we go. We're we're going back now to uh, to pre event. Oh yeah. Well, there was also a, what's golden ticket. We will be talking about uh, golden ticket coming up later. So pre event revenue enhancers. There are ways to make money in that event other than just the day of the event. So for example, in advance. You can get auction items underwritten. Maybe you get some great consigned items, but there's a cost associated with a consigned item. There's nothing wrong with having a sponsor to underwrite that item. So perhaps you have a trip to Mexico that might have a cost of a thousand dollars. You can find uh, you can find an underwriter that'll cover that cost of a thousand dollars, so that when you sell that trip to Mexico, a hundred percent of the profit goes to your bottom line. You're not sending money off to a to a consignment house. Uh, sponsorships and table sales, obviously, uh, you know, if, you're, if your dinner is going to cost you $100 a person, you could sell a ticket 
uh, at $150 a person or sell a table of 10 at $1,500 uh, as, a, as a table sale or a sponsorship. I also like to recommend using what I call tiered pricing. Tiered pricing would be a, your basic level, maybe a, a sponsor level is a, is a regular sponsor level of $1,000 for a table, but maybe there's a patron level, which is $2,000 a table, and a benefactor level, which is $3,000 level. So what do people get for that extra $1,000 or $2,000 if they're buying a table? Well, they get recognition, of course. They may perhaps get, uh, get uh, preferred seating in the room. They might get uh, certainly get acknowledged in the, in the program, uh, might be acknowledged on the website. Uh, they might get a special gift. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do to acknowledge those, but having three levels or four levels of ticket or th three or four levels of sponsorship for tables is very beneficial because there are people that can spend more and companies that can spend more than the base level. You might as well give them an, uh, you know, an avenue for doing that. Advertising and tributes go in your program book, of course. Ticket sales, we call it tickets and quotes because this is not a ticket sale. It's really an RSVP process. We call it tickets and quotes just so you get you know get that. But it really is it's it, it's an invitation only kind of a thing, and we want people to reserve uh, to reserve in advance. Regrets donation. This is a big one that a lot of people miss, and that's on your res on your reservation. Whether it's on your website if you're doing virtual reservations, or if it's on a physical invitation card, there should be something on there that says, "I am unable to attend, but please accept my donation of X dollars." That allows people to opt out, if you will, but still give you a donation. Don't want, don't miss that one. Sustaining funds. Sustaining funds are getting a donor or a sponsor to help you not for one year, but for multiple years. In other words, get a donor, a sponsor rather to say, I'm in for three years. And they get recognized as a sustaining sponsor. What does that mean? That means on all your advertising for your event, not just this year, but next year and the year after, you list them as a sustaining sponsor. And it's, sometimes it's easier for companies to do multi-year sponsorships than to do single-year sponsorships because with a multi-year sponsorship, they can build in the cost of that sponsorship into their budget. And it, instead of it being an off-budget cost in the current year, it's an on-budget cost the following year. So don't, uh, don't be afraid to ask for multiple years. Tori, do you have any sustaining, uh, any people that are sustaining? We do. Yeah, we have um, five sustaining yeah, uh, sponsors. So. And, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they probably appreciate that ability because they can build it into their budget. They don't, they don't have to wait for someone to come to them and ask for a donation each year. They know that they're going to spend a certain amount of money supporting you each year because it's built into their budget, right? Yeah, and one of our largest um, sponsor, in fact, it has been easier for um, our anniversary years. Last year was our 30th anniversary, for example, um, to ask them to bump up their sponsorship to that $30,000 level that one year. And really, it's only asking for $5,000 more than what they budgeted for instead of coming in and asking for a $30,000 sponsorship. Wonderful. Now, matching funds pre-event, this is one that uh, that is often missed as well. On your RSVP form or on your virtual form, if it's on a website, you should have a checkbox that says, my employer has employee matching funds. And why is that important? Because it allows you to track your attendees that are coming with the ability to have their employer match whatever they spend in the way of, of cash uh, cash contribution the night of your event. It makes it much easier for you to follow up with them after the event because they know that you know that they've already told you that they have it. Whereas if you just approach people after the event and say, by the way, did you, do you happen to work for a company that has matching funds? You're more likely to, to get ignored because you're old news. You were last week's event or last month's event. But if you ask them up front, you can remind them, hey, well, you told us when you registered that you work for XYZ company and they have a matching gift. They're more likely to be responsive when you post event, ask them for that for that match. Golden Ticket, quite simply, uh, is a chance to, uh, we call it best of live, Golden Ticket. Uh, there's different names for it. But it's a raffle where people get to choose any item out of the live auction catalog up to 
the value of tickets sold. Often it's a limited ticket raffle, like 100 tickets at, at $100 a piece, $10,000 uh, comes in. People know their odds of winning are one in 100 because they're only selling 100 tickets. You bring in 10,000 and the winning, you draw the ticket right before the live auction and the uh, the winner gets to choose any item they wish out of the live auction catalog up to the dollar amount brought in by the ticket. So if you only sell $5,000 worth of tickets for whatever reason, they can take any item worth up to $5,000. And usually they don't. They usually take the item they really want, which is often much lower value. So it's a really good moneymaker. Online auction, pretty self-explanatory. Website, mobile bidding, text to bid, cell phone auction, basically mobile, mobile bidding. Email marketing campaigns, let people make donations, of course. Uh, social media and peer-to-peer -peer team fundraisers. We're going to get into that a little later with, with David. So uh, just as a pull out here, the revenue enhancer, the bucket raffle. Uh, this is, uh, as, as Tori mentioned, this worked really well for, for Tori because they were able to make a lot of money on their bucket raffle without uh, having to spend the time and, and the energy to do, a, to do all that as a silent auction, correct? Hey, Tori, on the email marketing, how much... Share, if you could share with the audience, how long and what did you do as far as your steps went on, you know, pre-event, right? I mean, do you start make, when do you start with the awareness? When did you start with your email marketing campaigns? How frequently or infrequently did you send them out? And then, it, it, because I think those are really important pieces. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, tend to send out our save the date in our event is um, the second weekend of August. So we send out our save the date in late April. Um, and then the invites go out in early June timeframe. Um, and around that same time is when we're sending out our email campaigns, which are complementing our um, printed materials. And so what I found over the years, um, I've been doing this for 10 years now. And what I found is that there's a really fine line between sending out too many emails and not sending out enough emails. Um, you're sending out too ma many emails, you're getting people unsubs unsubscribing from um, you know, your marketing materials and that's not anything that we want. And too few emails, nobody knows when your event is, they forget about you. Um, and so on average, I would say every other week, um, when we get closer to the event um, and then the last three days before the event really hitting it hard, but leading up to the event, the months where, you know, people don't really have their schedules planned. It's usually once a month at that point on our end. Um, but I will go back to the regrets donations um, that Jay had mentioned. In addition to just a blank, you know, I regret to inform you that I'm unable to attend giving them options to give specifically to certain areas of your program, we've found has been really successful, um, particularly with those people who only have $25 to give, because instead of throwing out the invite and saying, well, I, you know, I don't have any impact on this, giving them the option that, hey, $25 supports one lesson for a rider. All of a sudden you have a hundred people giving you $25 that would not have given otherwise. So I think it's important, you know, even in your pre-event materials to give those different levels um, and opportunities for people to give no matter how much they do have to offer. Yeah, what a wonderful point. What a wonderful point. We we got a question uh, from Paul. Uh, do you offer a small discount for sustaining sponsor level? Uh, I am not a big fan of giving away money. Uh, I think instead, if you want to uh, encourage someone to be a sustaining uh, sustaining donor, sustaining sponsor, I'd offer them an additional benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, don't 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 reduce your income, increase the awareness for them. Maybe you offer them a larger ad in in your program book. Maybe you uh, include them on your letterhead so they so they see their name on the letterhead every year. Maybe it's uh, uh, some other benefit uh, that you can offer to them. but I, I think you're always better off to let the money levels be the money levels, but offer additional, uh, you know, different reward, if you will, for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. Good question. Thanks, Paul. All right. So we're going to go to during the event in Revenue Enhancers. Uh, live and silent, fairly, fairly obvious, silent. You bid on paper bid sheets or you bid by mobile bidding. Uh, the mission asks, this has a, a thousand names to it, you know, uh, raise the paddle, fund a need, fund an item, 
uh, stand up for stand up for kids, uh, you know, emotional appeal. You need it's all the same thing. It's means it's during the live auction, the auctioneer pauses, has somebody talk about the the cause, the mission, and then the auctioneer asks for people to make donations directly to that cause, starting at a high level and working your way down. Always better to start with a big number and move down than to start at a low level and go up. Uh, and so, you know, and again, you know your you know your room for some. For some rooms, the opening level might be appropriate to be five thousand dollars. For other rooms, the opening level might be appropriate to be fifty thousand. It really depends on who's coming to the event. Uh, and then raffles, of course, pretty straightforward. There's all different kinds of raffles. We mentioned bucket raffle before. There's also fifty-fifty raffles, and there's there's uh, just a, a wide variety of that. Uh, online auction, pretty self-explanatory. Let people bid on items. That are not attending the people that are not attending the event, let them still participate in your silent auction, and you can roll the amount of this online auction in advance of your event into your evening's totals. Text to bid, uh, cell phone auction, again, mobile bidding, matching funds. Uh, the night of the event is great. What I do as an auctioneer, a lot of times, if someone says we've got a five thousand dollar match for our during our mission ask or during our raise the paddle, I would not use that five thousand dollar match at the $5,000 level, I would hold that $5,000 match. And then when we got to the $1,000 level, I'd say, folks, thanks for the generosity of whoever the individual is. We have $5,000 as a match for, for the first 5,000 people that raise, or excuse me, the first five people that raise their card at $1,000. So your first five $1,000 donors will be matched thanks to the generosity. So we can have $10,000. And that, tends to pull people in. People love matching funds. So you certainly would want to try and use that uh, if if you can get it. The bucket raffle, we talked about that before, but that can also be automated with text to bid. One of the nice features of, and I don't want to sound like an advertisement, but it is, you know, it's in here. So I want to talk about it. Uh, one of the nice things about the text to bid mobile bidding platform is that you can automate that bucket raffle. You can let people buy one or multiple tickets and literally virtually drop it into the virtual bucket of the item that they're trying to win. And then the system, the dashboard, the text to bid dashboard will allow you to hit a button that says, you know, select bucket raffle winners and it'll automatically go through and find the right winner. And then we send a, a text message out to each of, each of those individuals that they won that particular item. So it works really well. Golden ticket we talked about before. Dessert dash is kind of a West Coast thing. A lot of folks on the East Coast don't know what it's about, but essentially if appropriate, we let people at the dinner tables pass around a form that lets those people at the dinner table make a cash contribution, a donation uh, towards that table, getting to select their own dessert off of a table of desserts based on the level of your generosity. So the table that is able, willing to pay the most get to select the first dessert and the second most generous table gets to select the, the second dessert and of course the least generous table gets the lime jello or the twinkies hey saying? jay jay i think another nice thing and with the text to bid and when any organization is asking for sponsorships sponsorships just like anybody else want acknowledgement and acknowledgement's always nice and we do and we'll, we can talk for a long time about acknowledgements the one thing i really do like about the text to bid when you're setting up your sponsorship programs and you're saying, you know, you get 20 seats or 10 tables or whatever that sponsorship is, in addition to great advertising for them, is the text to bid because you can put on this mobile device. Now, they could be bidding for items. They could be bidding for raffle tickets. They could be giving a donation. But when they log in, they the organization, depending upon their sponsorship level, you can put their name right on this. So yep. not only are they getting the acknowledgement in a brochure when they send it out, but this is ongoing. It could be pre, post, or, or and during. And it's really nice because now everybody that's actually at the event or bidding on that's virtual that couldn't do it and, and bidding on this are seeing the company's names and the companies love right. that. So it's a really added piece to it. No, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, more more visibility for the sponsor. Anytime you can give, and that by the way might be one of those rewards you give to that sustaining sponsor that uh, that we asked was asked about by Paul earlier, is that uh, you know if you become a sustaining sponsor, we'll make sure that your logo was one of the logos that we 
that we display on people's cell phones uh, or or uh, a presenting sponsor. You can have different sponsor levels, all that sort of thing. Great, great, great point. Uh, the wine pole and spirit pole. This is interesting. You know, a lot of people know about the wine wall where you essentially will have 25, 30, 50 bottles of wine in bags and you pull a number out of a out of a uh, out of a bucket or out of a uh, fishbowl or something. And if it says 23, you get bag number 23 and that's the wine. One variation on that uh, that we've seen is a spirits pull where instead of wine, these are bottles of, uh, of, of liquor. It could be vodkas and scotches and so forth. That's kind of interesting. And then I've seen some folks that are also doing what we call a spin the bottle, where the wine bottle, instead of just pulling a number and grabbing a grabbing a bag with a wine with wine in it, you actually have a spinner and you spin the spin the bottle and the bottle neck ends up pointing towards a uh, towards one of the bottles. So that's just a variation variation of that. One of the questions that uh, Carly asked, and I'll cover it real quick, is how do you recommend approaching potential sponsors? Uh, where you don't already have a relationship. And that's what we call a cold call. I'm not a big fan of cold calls. What I would do instead is I would gather my team together and I would have my team list everybody that they know, starting with themselves, their spouses, their extended family, their coworkers, uh, their neighbors, the places they normally shop, uh, and and have everybody make a list. And so you're going to have 20 or 30 people uh, for each individual. And if you got 10 people on your on your team, that will you potentially have up to 200 potential contacts. Then ask, are any of those contacts affiliated with the sponsor that you're trying to get? Maybe they're an employee. Maybe there's a friend works at that at that company. Maybe they're prior employees of, of the company, uh, whatever it might be. But if you first make a list of what I call your who list, make the who list first. And then after you have your who list, what do you want? Do the what after the who and see if you can play the match game because somebody is likely to know somebody that works at or has a relationship with that sponsor you're trying to get. And that it avoids the cold call. Then you deputize that person to go talk to that, to that uh, new, uh, and then it's no longer a non-relationship. There is a relationship there. So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that answered. Post event revenue enhancers. We mentioned uh, matching funds before. Remember that job is made much easier if you know going in before your event who has a who has a relationship with a company that is going to do a match because they're an employee of that company. I know in our area here, you know, in the Seattle area, we've got Starbucks and Boeing and and uh, you know Amazon and and uh, Google and all the others. Well, they all have a matching program. So knowing the attendees at the event have that relationship is much better than trying to do it after. Worst case, if you can't get it during the RSVP process, get it at least during the check-in process. As people are checking in and you're handing them their bid number, handing them their packet, say, by the way, do you happen to work for a company that, uh, one of the local companies that do matching? Employer, that's the employer match we just talked about. Uh, I don't know if we wanna go through each of these individually in the interest of time, but- uh, No, for time though, AJ, for time, but- yeah. Tori, you, you, you've grown year over year over year over year. You're doing something really right, obviously. You know, it's not, it's not, you did great. Is there, from from the after, are you sharing any type of impact reports? Are you doing any continuous engagement after the event to let them know where their donations are going, how it actually affected? And, and maybe you could touch on that from a post event. Yeah, absolutely. So we do send out immediately following the event um, handwritten thank you notes, which uh, rare thing these days, um, yeah. but handwritten thank you notes to everyone who attended, whether they gave $1,000 or $10,000 or any amount of money. Um, we also send out continuing thank you campaigns through our e-blasts and social media, and then um, post an ad in the newspaper thanking, that's one final time that we're able to thank our sponsors and all of the attendees. Um, but then, you know, once we have all of the figures compiled and we're able to break down what we were able to raise financially and how that applies to our different programming, we're able to give them kind of a snapshot of what they helped us achieve. And that, that tends to be about a month after the event, um, just in terms yeah. of time, it takes a bit to get everything sorted, but yeah. That's great. A couple yeah. of quick, before we leave off, I, I do want to go back and talk about 
uh, the, the sell again twice. So you can go back up a slide, if you don't mind, real, real quick. I want to talk about the sell again. But before I do, there are a couple of questions came in on, on the Q&A. And one was, if you do a golden ticket on an online auction, how do you take the selected item out? Uh, if I wouldn't do a golden ticket for an online auction. But one thing that recently happened with a Boys and Girls Club event uh, that I was involved in, they allowed people to buy tickets in advance, and they did not have to be present to win. So the way they set it up was that if you were present to win, you you got to select the item the night of the event. If you were not going to be present because you were not attending the event, you automatically got a thousand dollar Nordstrom's gift card. So the idea was that the gifts the thousand dollar gift card was part of the live auction, and if if someone uh, won that was in the room, they could select it or any other thing they wanted. But if they weren't in the room, we could have pre-selected for them. That's what they were going to win. But typically, golden tickets work best if it's done in the room. I want to talk about the sell again. The sell again is really a great way to boost your revenue post-event. If you know there are certain items that uh, that can be donated more than once, and often this is consignment items, doesn't have to be. Maybe there's an individual that donates something. If it was a real hot seller at the auction, if you know who the second high bidder was or the third high bidder was, going back to that donor and say, you know, your item was very, very popular at our auction and we have a disappointed second high bidder. We'd love to turn that second high bidder from disappointment into happy. Would you be willing to donate your item again so that we can reach out to that second high bidder? More often than not, donors are very honored to realize their item was so well received and they'll go ahead and donate it a second time post event. And you can go ahead and get that get that uh, that additional revenue. It works really well, by the way, if you're using mobile bidding, because in a mobile bidding platform or an online bidding platform, it automatically tracks what we call a bid history. So you can look at the bid history and say, wow, this item went well over value, but the second high bidder was also over value. And the third high bidder was also over value. So why don't we reach out to the donor and see if we can get another one or even a third one and go and then reach out to those second and third that are in the in the bid history. So golf fundraisers, uh, lots of uh, revenue enhancing ideas here. Super tickets is one I absolutely love. At a golf tournament, there's a lot of ways to raise money, but people like the golfers end up feeling like they're nickel and dime. You know, well, pay to pay on the casino hall, pay for the long drive, pay for the putting contest, pay for raffle tickets, pay for drink tickets, you know, and on and on and on and on. And they start feeling like they're they're uh, being uh, nickel and dime. So what my recommendation is, take all the elements of the golf tournament. The closest to the pin, the long drive, the chance to win a car, the putting contest, the rev the raffle tickets, you know, the, the drink tickets, take everything and assign a value to each of it. And maybe when you add it all up, it's a hundred dollars worth of value. And then bundle it all and sell it at one time at check-in called a, a, a something called a super ticket for a discount. So maybe $75 or $85, you get a hundred dollars worth of value you will find that nearly every golfer will do that because many of those golfers, a little dirty little secret here, many of those golfers are playing for free because they were invited to play in a foursome paid for by a company. You have a company buys a foursome and they invite three people to play with them. Three of the four golfers have no skin in the game, so to speak. They're playing for free. Well, they feel a little guilty about that. So when they go to check in and they're offered the opportunity to pay $75 or $85 to get a super, they say, yeah, fine. Put me in, I'll take it. And you'll you'll get almost 100% of the golfers will, will buy the super ticket. 18-hole uh, auction, this is using mobile bidding uh, to let the golfers bid during the round rather than taking time after the round to run a silent auction. You know, after the golfers have been out there for four or five hours on the course, they don't want to hang around for an hour, hour and a half bidding at a silent auction. But what you can do is put those items on display at check-in and assign each to an item number and then let people register their cell phone and then during the day, they bid on their cell phone throughout their day. And then you close that silent auction 15 minutes after the last golfer's off the course. You save all that silent auction time, but you actually have a five-hour silent auction. And of course, the golfers get notified a text message when they've been outbid. Uh, cheat for charity. I love this one. This is a no-brainer. You always are going to have one long, long drive hole, like a long par five. And most of the golfers know that at best they're going to get a birdie on that, but more than likely they're going to get a par or a bogey on it. But if they pay the right amount, perhaps pay $20 a foursome, 
they can move up to the 150 yard marker and make their first shot from 150 yards out on the par five rather than from 500 yards out on the par five. And again, just about every team will do it because they know that if they don't do it and the other teams do do it, their chances of winning is decreased. So it's almost an automatic that every team's going to pay to cheat. Uh, that's the way it is. Uh, and then long drive bad accuracy. Uh, good. What I mean by that is this. There are a certain number of golfers, a handful of them, who can hit the ball really a long way. But most of the golfers that come to your golf tournament are not long hitters. So they are automatically eliminated from the long drive. But if you change it to an accuracy drive to where they don't have to hit it long, they just have to hit it straight, you'll pull more long, you'll pull more golfers into the ability to win that contest. Helicopter crane drive, this is just a raffle. Essentially, they buy a golf ball, the number on it goes in a bucket, and then you have a crane or a drone or a helicopter drop those numbered golf balls towards a target. The ball that lands close to the target wins a prize. Wood place or show, bucket raffle. Uh, this can be automated pretty easily using text to bid but essentially it, it's like a horse race. You've got 20 horses. Each horse has a number, one through 20. The, the golfers buy tickets, and they drop the tickets into a bucket or virtually with text to bid uh, virtually put it in a bucket that relates to the horses they think are going to win. And then during the awards banquet, you literally run the two-minute Kentucky Derby. Now, which Kentucky Derby do you run? It's random. They don't know in advance which which one you're going to run. It could be the 1930 Kentucky Derby. It could be the 1975 Kentucky Derby. It could be the 20, 2015 Kentucky Derby. But you run the, you run, you literally video run from YouTube the race. And of course, all the golfers are really excited because they're looking to see if their horse is going to win. You're going to get a win place and show out of the horse, out of the horse race. And then those three buckets are pulled for win place and show the other 17 buckets are losers. And then you reach into those three buckets and pull out one winner for win place and show. So it's a lot of fun. It makes the, uh, makes the, uh, the, the raffle a little more animated. Casino hall basically closest to the pin team fundraising competitions by foursome. Won't spend a lot of time on, on these uh, silent auction bidding course tied to scoring. Uh, the the silent auction bidding tied to scoring essentially means that if someone bids on a silent auction item, their team gets to save a stroke. And if they're someone on their team actually wins an auction item, then they, they save two strokes. So the maximum that a team could take off of their, of their uh, score at the end of the day is three strokes, one stroke for bidding on any item and two strokes for winning any auction item. But that encourages the golfers to actually bid on the silent auction. All right. Uh, community fundraisers. Now we're off to, off to David. Yeah, I know for time reasons, and we only have a few more minutes, I'm going to go through this quickly, but if you'd like to learn more, and I think the best way to share this with, I'm going to ask uh, Gabby, to put up the link to this page. And they are doing, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Ronald McDonald House of Central Georgia is running three different types of events, but in doing these three different types of events, and they are staggered out over a period of time, but they're doing it based upon team. So um, so what I'd like Gabby to do, so you can really go through this, but it, it's really, it's, 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 it's empowering groups. It's empowering people to work together you know, it's cultivating so many things, whether it's don you know, your donor involvement, your volunteer involvement, your board member involvement. It does a lot of things. It, it spurs competition, healthy competition, good competition, uh, not bad competition, right? Because people can see who the top teams are, who the top captains are, who the top donors are. So it's a really nice thing to do, but you can really use this for the event side of this. So if Gabby, if you could post that, they can go right to that link. You can see exactly what I need to do and we'll go from that. And then just for time reasons, we'll just skip to peer-to-peer -peer fundraising because I, I think peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, when you are running an event, it's an other great way to have individuals. And, and I look at this, team fundraising, when you think about it, on average, more than 20% of all donors refer other donors. And this is a really great source in addition on top of teams um, that it's individuals. When individuals are doing this, this is another great way, first of all, about donor acquisition, because they're sending a special message to their friends. They can send it through social media. There could be a leaderboard on this. There's a lot of good things. And then when the donor does give a donation specifically to the person that's hosting that individual page, everybody's getting notifications, which is really nice. 
the person that posted the page is getting a no notification on the donor, the organization is getting a notification, and the individual is getting an automatic thank you, a custom thank you acknowledgement receipt. And again, it lends to best practices, right? It lends to reaching out to that new donor if it was a new donor on that. And they can say, hey, your friend's doing this. Would you like to learn more? It's another great way to increase your donor acquisition database. I've seen people use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising just for what's in their current database of donors. And it's more about acknowledgement and reminders of what they're doing and the impact that they're having. So it's a, just another level. When you're running an event, you can use peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for the event themselves. I've seen organizations use it as, hey, it's dance, a virtual dancing with the stars. Buy more stars and I get to win the event, right? So it, there's a lot of creative ways uh, and we could talk days about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, but it's another great way, especially when you know 20% of donors refer other donors. This is another nice way. And, and again, you're not just receiving money, you're getting all of their information into your donor relationship management database as well. All right. Well, we talked about a lot today, but if there is anything that you saw that you would like to learn more about, we are so happy to talk to you more about anything you saw. Um, if you hit yes, it's a, a free fundraising consultation and demo. Someone from our team will be in contact with you um, to share more insights, uh, how you can put those own revenue enhancers into your own events, whether it's any of the auction enhancers we saw today, any of the golf fundraising revenue enhancers, or if you're interested in team fundraising and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and wanna learn more about how you can implement those strategies at your own event, we can definitely uh, get in touch with you to talk a little bit more about it. Um, I'll go ahead and we do have some questions. Um, we'll answer those while I have you guys here. Um, so this one comes from Adam and he wants to know, are there any tips to help encourage more participation from a non-guest to participate in an online auction? Well, really, the, the, the non if you say non-guest, I assume that means somebody who's not attending your event. But yeah, that's, that's where your social media and your and your uh, database, your existing database come in. You, know, you want to make sure that you invite everybody that's known to you to participate, send them a link to the online auction if, if necessary, publicize it in social media. But I'd also be asking the guests that are coming to the event if they know of anybody in their circle of friends that would not necessarily be coming to the event, but would they as guests of the event uh, encourage the, their friends to participate in the online portion, even if they can't attend the event themselves. Nice. That's great. Uh, we do have a one more. This is an interesting question. Uh, do you have any suggestions for when a quote unquote planted donor at your highest funded need level doesn't actually raise their paddle? We had right. this happen and then nobody volunteered for two more levels. So it was a bit awkward. Interesting. I was just <laughs> about, I was asked, I was about to answer that privately. Uh, I was typing as you were reading it. Uh, it's not a good idea to have a pl planting is not good because it's it's still an unknown. What I would do is I would survey all the people that are known to be coming that are known supporters of the organization and those especially that have donated before and say, at what level do you think you're going to be comfortable raising your paddle during our fund to need at the event? Let the auctioneer know that. And then as an auctioneer, the auctioneer should do what we call a soft ask at one level above. So if we know for sure that someone is a committed to 5,000, it's okay to do a soft ask at 10 because you're backed up at five. Or if you're, if they, if they most you're going to have in the room is 2,500, then do a soft ask at 5,000. You don't have to harp on it. You don't have to wait on, you know, make it make it uncomfortable people but just say hey, we we know that we are probably going to be able to have a donor here tonight uh, at five thousand dollars but would somebody like to kick start us in a really big way at perhaps ten thousand you'd be amazed the number of times i do that that we get surprised and somebody actually starts at the higher level but if that five thousand is a plant and you don't really have one at five thousand then the risk you have is you ask at 10 and then you drop to five and you got nothing at five now you go to 2500 and people are looking around the room trying to decide, you know, who's going to go first. So uh, it, I would not, I would only deal with real donation expectations, not false donation expectation, just good practice. All right. Anything else? Any other, don any other questions? I've answered a few privately, by the way. One of the questions that I answered privately was, 
is it really fair to the highest bidder if we post event sell the same item to the second and third highest bidder? And the it's a great question. The answer is it is fair because we always ask the second and third high bidder to increase their bid to pay the same as the highest bidder. You should never sell the same item to two bidders at two different prices. Even in the room live as an auctioneer, if I had two of the same item, I would never sell one item for 5,000 and the second one for 4,500. They have to both be at the same price, even if necessary, bring the winning bidder down to the level as opposed to, if you can't get the second high bidder to go up, it's better to lose a little bit on the highest bidder to come down to be able to, to be able to sell it twice. Yeah. But everybody pays the same. Okay. Hey Jay, there was one more question and I know you have dealt with this really well. Are there any laws that limit the structure of raffle activity? Seems that raffles can be considered gambling and host has to follow certain guidelines in California specifically. Yeah, I mentioned actually earlier on when we brought up raffles, I said as appropriate based on your local and state rules. Every state has different rules. There's some states, like Washington happens to be one of them, that uh, does not allow any sort of online raffle unless you have a unless you have a gaming permit. So you can't do an online auction and sell raffle tickets on your website or by, by mobile bidding in the state of Washington unless you have a gaming permit. Uh, so yes, check your check your local laws for that for sure. Yeah. Okay. So so for time reasons, I'm just gonna if anybody is interested, um, you know this was a really really great meeting, and I, and I I know there were a few other uh, questions that I received, but a lot of the things that we talked about, and you know where you're moving, or you have three or four different events a year, and you're moving data, or you know finding it difficult, you know to acknowledge people, or even moving the data. We, we understand the challenges and a lot, there's a lot of great software out there. There's a lot of good auction software out there. There's a lot of good event software. There's a lot of good donor relationship management and many other applications. But I think one of the challenges that a lot of organizations are having today, and I'm gonna do this fast for time and we're gonna wrap it up here, is the movement of data. And that's really always a constraint with many, many people. And it's not just from an internal perspective, it's acknowledgement outside. And if you wait too long to acknowledge, you're having, maybe not the most consistent donor engagement and mo most, you know, you want your donors to have a better, you know, experience. And, and we really did find that solution for a lot of organizations that are out there today. And the way that we've done that is through what we call an all-in-one, and it should be a unified donor database where you have all of these different applications. And again, you don't have to buy all the applications today. But no matter what applications you're using with our exceed further application, it is truly one unified database. So everything is integrated automated, meaning that whether they register for a ticket, whether they buy a raffle ticket, all of it automatically goes directly into the donor relationship management, sends a cop, sends an automatic custom thank you acknowledgement receipt, and sends the staff a notification. There's more to it than that but I'm just sharing that with you. And for you that don't know who Ariva is, we've been in the industry for over 30 years. We have over 6,000 clients. Our clients, we heard a little bit today, have done over 30,000 different types of live virtual hybrid events and galas and fundraisers. Our software was exclusively built for the industry. And not only do we have 6,000 clients, but we have been embedded and approved by many, many national organizations that you can see here today. Um, we have many applications with the Exceed Further applications. These are, uh, you know, both our, our online fundraising on the right side top and, and all the donor relationship, but it's all one solution. Our auction, not everybody does auctions, so we separate it out. We have three wonderful applications for the auction business. If you're running just live and, you know, the silent auction, we have applications for that. If you're running the silent and you want to have a hybrid because people can't attend, and then as Jay mentioned a few times, you know, we have that mobile bidding for live. And, and then we do have the auction software as well. We have a lot of different services. We have over 95% retention rate. And it's not just because of our software, it's also because of all the services. These are just some of the wonderful outcomes that we've seen with our clients. You know, on average, they're seeing a return on their investment within three weeks. We're, we're unifying typically, and I saw three to four, you know, applications uh, into one. People that are having a board that has a financial responsibility are seeing 100% of their board giving. The way that we built this, it's exciting. No one leaves your website. If they're registering on, they're on a registration form, uh, they do not leave your website. Once they fill it in, submit and pay, 
you can redirect them, you can keep on the page, you can do it a lot of other things. And for the clients that are really looking to increase donor acquisition, we track this, we, we're seeing over a 300% increase where there's a real focus on that. These are just some of the wonderful outcomes and our clients are with us for good and we're really proud of that for all the different things that we do as a company, providing client success and online trading and a Reaver Academy. Today, we're doing an educational webinar. We're happy about that. We provide all sorts of different technical support and we do really provide a lot of different best practices and guidelines and resources. So go to our website and um, we do a podcast. Jay and I do a wonderful podcast. Jay, maybe you want to end it with that. Yeah, driven by cause. Uh, we uh, we we typically put at least one of those, sometimes two of them in the in, in, in the process each month and uh, driven by cause. And if you have an interest in our podcast, I think you could just go to, where, where can we go, uh, Gabby, to, to uh, log in for, for for the podcast? Which which services are we on? Sure, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or to get all the links, just go to www.ariva.com with two R's and you'll see a tab that says podcasts and all of our episodes are there. And we interview some wonderful people in the industry. These are all, these are all giants of the industry that uh, that we have on. So and we've done quite a few of them. So you're going to want to go check them out, and certainly uh, keep you busy for a while. I am so happy we were able to do this today, Tori. You are fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was great, uh, great having you join us. There were a few other lingering questions. We'll try and get through those as well. Uh, you can also. Uh, send us uh, you know, a request and we'll answer every single question that you send to us, promise. Well, I just like to thank the audience. I really hope you got a lot out of it. We had a, a lot of nice comments on this. Um, we appreciate everything that you do each and every day for your communities. Tori, we thank you for what you're doing every single day. And we really appreciate you sharing your wonderful experiences, your success, how you've gotten there over time. Jay, I always thank you for your knowledge, your expertise of over 30 plus years and really sharing that with the audience. And, and a special thanks to Gabby for really coordinating this and putting this together and making us look really great on the slides and everything else that you do. So I, I just want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart for, for a great event. Thank you.